My assigned topic is secularism in India, and <clears throat> I've been told I should speak about it historically and speak to the current situation. I'm keen to speak to the current situation, though I feel a little impertinent speaking about it with uh, young activists here who have been in the field for so long and know much more about it than I do, and people like Harshmandar and others. Uh, anyway, I'm going to make an honorable stab at, at speaking about it, and let me begin by <coughs> uh, saying that we can't really understand secularism uh, unless we situate it historically. And secularism is a European notion. It's not an Indian notion. Uh, and the secularism India adopted was the secularism that originated in Europe. <clears throat> so it's good to get the genealogy of secularism right because <clears throat> uh, uh, concepts have uh, origins in very specific circumstances. You can't analyze a concept or philosophically expand a concept without situating it in its genealogy, in the conditions under which it arose, because it applies with urgency when the conditions under which it arose are replicated. And so I'd like to quickly situate it in its origins in Europe and then move on to talk about briefly about its its trajectory in India in the 20th century, and then speak to uh, the conditions we are, for, we are landed in now. In the 17th century, roughly, in the middle of the 17th century, after the Westphalian peace, certain standard ways of legitimizing state power uh, ceased to have any hold on people. For centuries, state power was legitimated and justified by a theological ground, uh, the divine rights of the monarch who personified the state. In, with the rise of the new sciences in the 17th century, that justification for state power ceased to have any hold in the people's minds. So a new form of justification was sought, and it was sought not in theology, but in political psychology. By that I mean that a new form of entity had emerged after the Westphalian peace. Much later it came to be called the nation. And scattered locations of power uh, began to be increasingly centralized. And when that happened, the concept of the nation and the concept of the state became indissolubly fused. In fact, they were represented by a hyphen. Uh, became the nation-state. And there was no understanding the one without the other. <clears throat> And justifications of state power in this new psychological version, rather than theological version, took the form of creating a feeling in the populace for the left-hand side of this hyphenated conjunction, nation-state, rather than directly for the state. So you had to generate in the population a feeling for the nation, the left-hand side of the conjunction, but because the nation and the state were indissolubly fused, that provided a justification for the exercise of state power in that centralized form over the nation. It really only happened in the middle of the 17th century. A nationwide tax for the first time was imposed by Cromwell in the interregnum. That's the middle of the 17th century. So, <clears throat> so it was done by this psychology, political psychology, of generating a feeling on the left-hand side of this concept in order to justify the exercise of state power, that is, on the right-hand side of the disjunction. How was this feeling generated all over Europe? By an absolutely standard ploy, uh, 
which was <clears throat> to create a feeling in the populace by identifying an external enemy within, subjugating it and despising it, and saying the nation is ours, not theirs. That's the history of Europe. Everywhere in Europe, this was how state power was legitimated by nation-building exercises of this kind after the Westphalian peace. An external enemy within to be subjugated and despised, saying the nation is ours, not theirs. The Jews, the Irish, the Catholics and Protestant countries, the Protestants and Catholic countries. That's the history of Europe. <clears throat> now, going to India, the question arose, was secularism ever something which was very central during the 20th century? And the answer is, it was not for almost the entire period of that fantastic series of decades of the freedom movement, uh, which is perhaps the most creative political period in the life of our country. And it's really remarkable that not just Gandhi, but even Nehru hardly ever talked of secularism for decades during the freedom movement. And Nehru and Gandhi were completely at one on this. <coughs> Now, why was this so? Because they both argued, and it's not much known that Nehru argued this along with Gandhi, but if you read The Discovery of India, which is by far his most profound book, uh, it is exactly his argument. Nehru says that secularism emerged in Europe to counter the damage that I've just expanded as occurring in Europe. Nation-building exercises, finding an external enemy within, subjugating it and saying the nation is ours, not theirs. <coughs> and when that happened in Europe, Nehru says, there were minoritarian backlashes to it. And many of the majoritarian and minoritarian uh, majorita this majoritarianism that I've just described and the minoritarian backlashes were based, as I said, on religious grounds, Protestants, Catholics, <coughs> Jews. <coughs> and so it was felt that even though the fault line began with religious majoritarianism in this nation building, in the state legitimizing in Europe, even though the fault line began with religious majoritarianism, because there were religious minoritarian backlashes to it. This created a civil strife in which it was thought religion was the source of the strife, so religion must be ushered out of the orbit of the state and the polity. That's the origins of secularism in Europe, to repair the damage of state legitimizing nation building exercises. That's the genealogy the social conditions, the political conditions under which secularism emerged. Nehru and Gandhi said that there's no such damage in India. So secularism is irrelevant. If secularism's genealogy is that it's there to repair a certain damage which has a certain provenance, a certain conception of nation building, and state legitimizing, that has not happened here. So secularism is besides the point. This is all through most of the freedom movement. <clears throat> now, why was this so vivid for Nehru and Gandhi? The answer is that they claimed that, and Discovery of India is really mostly about this idea, <clears throat> They claimed that Indian society did not have this damage. It was always characterized by what, and I'm using Nehru's expression here, an unself-conscious pluralism. 
And unself-conscious pluralism, it's a very interesting term, the use of the word unself-conscious there. And, and his claim was that since this unself-conscious pluralism has never been undermined by the kinds of things that I just expounded as happened in Europe, secularism was irrelevant. Gandhi said this even more explicitly. The discovery of India says it somewhat more indirectly. Now, what was the alternative idea of a nation or nationalism in India? All these terms, nationalism and all, came later. What I've described in Europe is something that a whole range of concepts later on described it. Feeling for the nation came to be called nationalism. And when statistical and numerical forms of discourse came to be deployed in the study of societies and polities, notions of majority and minority emerged. This way of creating a feeling for the nation came to be called majoritarianism and minority backlashes and so on. So it's later vocabulary, but the phenomenon started much earlier. So Gandhi and Nehru's view all through the most of the long freedom movement was nationalism for us is nothing of that kind that happened in Europe. Nationalism for us was rather to replay the unself-conscious pluralism of centuries-long Indian society in the national movement, which would be inclusive to reflect that unself-conscious pluralism. So nationalism meant something entirely different than what it was in Europe. Because in Europe it had a very specific purpose and it was a very specific ploy, what I was calling this subjugation of, a, of an external enemy within. Now, Nehru and Gandhi's efforts to, uh, to make real this idea that for, in this country, nationalism would be just simply a replaying of an unself-conscious pluralism in a national movement, which would reflect that pluralism, was manifested in very specific moments, which some of which have been very carefully studied, some of which have not been very carefully studied. So it was a, it was a quite different uh, nationalism, and they tried to, to really make that different ideal real in very specific, very dynamic, remarkable moments in, in the national movement, this inclusive ideal of the pluralism. And the two most significant moments were the Khilafat movement, which included the Muslims, qua Muslims. That was an essential part of insisting that the pluralism of Indian society would be reflected in the national movement. And the Khilafat movement was absolutely central to pursuing that ideal. I don't, uh, the Khilafat movement has been widely studied, and I think it, is, it was one of the most dynamic uh, movements in uh, uh, the freedom movement. It lasted, for, it's, it lasted for three years, but its effects lasted for five or six years longer and had, it had tremendously dynamic effects in a whole range of regions in the country, especially Bengal, UP, Bihar, Assam, and very progressive uh, uh, implications in political society, including making Muslims very uh, progressive on a whole range of fronts. And, and the remarkable peasant movements of the 1930s which were uh, not always in the control of the Congress and really were very often uh, independent of the anti-imperialist movement, but were movements of uh, agricultural laborers and sharecroppers against their overlords, could not have happened without the dynamism of the non-cooperation movement and the Khilafat movement before. These were real inspirations for later movements of the 1930s. So the inclusiveness of the Khilafat movement, uh, where Muslims were brought in, qua Muslims, was absolutely essential in understanding the nationalism that we sought. Another later 
uh, moment was uh, the Muslim mass contact program, which is hardly studied at all. There's one uh, excellent article on it by Mushirul Hassan, and that's about it. But it, it's a very important movement where once again Muslims were included, qua Muslims, and, uh, the, and the Congress Party was unafraid to say that we are using the concept, the term Muslim, to understand our nationalism. And it was an essential part of the inclusiveness. And people should be studying it much more carefully than they have. It was aborted in, in a year and a half, partly because of the Mahasabhat element in the Congress, uh, high command, but, uh, but it should be much more studied. It was in the hands of a Marxist, a Muslim Marxist, K.M. Mashraf, and uh, once again, it was an anti-imperialist national movement. The Muslim term was conspicuously used, but it was completely non-communal movement, just as the Khilafat movement was a non-communal movement, except for some symbolic, eccentric uh, reference to an external cause of the Khalifa um, in, the, in the Ottoman end of the Ottoman Empire. So, so these moments of inclusiveness were essential to making real the idea of uh, the Indian national movement being inclusive uh, in this way, replaying the pluralism of the country, essentially different from European uh, nationalism. So secularism didn't surface very conspicuously in this period because Secularism is there to contain and repair a certain damage hadn't occurred in India. Now, after independence, because of entirely formal reasons of law and constitution that emerged due to the reform of, of the Hindu Code Bill and other constitutional reforms, naturally secularism emerged as a central idea, but it was technically, legally, constitutionally characterized. And this was mostly on matters of uh, reform. And Ambedkar and Nehru were very central in pursuing that reform uh, and urging secularism as a tool for implementing that reform. But it's only in the 1980s that secularism emerged with a kind of urgency that we all have been witnessing in the last 30 years for very specific reasons that emerged in the 1980s. And secularism became, and quite rightly became, an obsessive focus after the 1980s because for the first time, secularism, as, uh, for the first time, Indian politics and society did begin to replicate what had happened in Europe in the genealogical account that I very briefly gave for which secularism was formulated. Finding an external enemy and subjugating it emerged in the 1980s for very specific reasons that have to do with the 1980s. So what I'm, I'm saying this with some emphasis because there is a view abroad around that a tendency to say that the Khilafat movement was a communal movement, it was the roots of, I don't know, uh, uh, Shahabuddin, the Shahi Imam, and so on. That the Mahasabhite element in the Congress are the roots of Narendra Modi, and so on. I think that view is completely wrong. And I think it's very important to, to say that it's wrong. Uh, I think the, the real grounds, the roots for uh, which replicated European history were laid in the 1980s. And I, I think it's really wrong to take the other view that, uh, that the roots were earlier. Uh, for instance, just three or four days ago, Javed Nakhvi wrote uh, uh, an op-ed in which he said the Khilafat movement was, was the roots of, of all this uh, Muslim communalism of, from the 80s on. Uh, that's the view I think is wrong and sort of historically ignorant. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that <coughs> historians have to make a distinction between roots and antecedents.
Antecedents, there are lots of antecedents. No doubt the, uh, the Mahasabhas in the Congress, Savarkar's uh, ideas and so on, were antecedents to what we're seeing today. But they're not the roots. And for something to be the root of something, you have to establish that there's an organic causal path from the root to the flowering later on. Nobody has shown that about uh, <coughs> either the Khilafat movement or the Mahasabhite and other Hindutva elements uh, in the earlier period. So I really think it's very important to stress that it, our society transformed in the 1980s for very specific reasons, and we have to diagnose those reasons. In the 1980s, as you all know, Indian society got democratized in a way that it had never been before. This was a result of a whole range of, of uh, uh, emerging conditions, but one of the, the triggers which was uh, very salient was uh, the Mandal Commission report, which generated <clears throat> a certain form of politics which caught fire. And it, uh, uh, and it created a whole range of the possibilities of benefits of various kinds for uh, particular uh, groups, castes, uh, and the spread after the Mandal Commission report and a kind of democratization took place where the people were making demands and the state was responding to them willy-nilly <coughs> in a way that had never happened until the 1980s. And, and the real Hindutva ideology took hold in the parliamentary politics of India only because it was felt by upper castes and the upper caste outlook that this new politics had revealed that Hinduism was a very divided society and something must be done to unify it and to paper over, however illusorily, these divisions that had been exposed by the mundialization of politics. And this was done by replicating the European idea that you find an external enemy so that Hinduism is united against it rather than divided within itself. And that really was the origins of a very determined effort to make uh, uh, Hindutva politics central to the parliamentary domain of politics in India. And it's when the BJP emerged. A second thing which we have to admit and recognize is that right-wing Hin Hindu politics gained a moral high ground during the emergency. You simply have to acknowledge that. And it gained a high ground, a moral high ground, because it showed some courage in opposing the emergency. And the center left did not show that courage. The center left, which was much more powerful, the CPM, the left showed the courage and opposed it, but the center left, which was much more powerful then, just lay down like doormats while Indira Gandhi and her son stamped on the liberties of this country. And the Hindu right wing got serious moral high ground and were able to enter with that high ground into the parliamentary politics of this country. Of course, the last seven or eight years have shown that they did not deserve that moral high ground because they were are far more authoritarian than the emergency. But there is no doubt, speaking historically, that it got that high ground and it came to have a centrality in parliamentary politics because it did show a certain courage that the center left, which was much more powerful then, did not. So, so the, the BJP only emerged as a result of the high ground that was won in that period and came to have a, a kind of respectability and centrality in parliamentary politics because of that. A third uh, thing that was essential to the 1980s 
onwards is actually a little later, Hindutva a little later, which is the populist version of Hindutva, which emerged somewhat later, uh, partly uh, over the Babri Masjid issues, and then of course uh, in the personage of the, the current prime minister, who's a populist figure. Uh, and this all is a more recent development. And its emergence, this kind of populism's emergence in Hindutva is, is very much of a piece with the emergence of populism, say, in the outcome of Brexit in Britain or of figures like Trump in the United States. And the reason for this populism, which is a slightly later period than the 80s, <coughs> where what I was describing earlier emerged, this populism emerges because of the seeming inability of the left to introduce in a central and serious way a vocabulary, a discourse, a critical discourse to make fundamental critiques of the political economy that had emerged in this country since 1990. That is, uh, not just in this country, but in Britain. So I'll take the two examples I've given of the United States and Britain. There's serious dissatisfaction among the working people in all these three countries. And there isn't, in the political zeitgeist of these countries, the conceptual and critical vocabulary and discourse to make a critique of the newly emerging political economy. And the reason for this has to be laid at the door of the Blairite Labour Party, the orthodoxies of the Democratic Party in the United States, and the Congress Party in this country. They ushered out of the political zeitgeist any deep understanding of that could allow ordinary working and workless people to understand what was going on in the political economy. That is, the orthodox liberal center in all these three countries usher out any possibility of deeply understanding economic issues. It's just not part of the zeitgeist. So if somebody comes along offering fabulously different zeitgeists that are virtually fascist, working and workless people having no other discourse critical vocabulary to turn to, turn to these other uh, forces offering fantastic illusory alternatives. So that's a third reason for the somewhat later popular populist emergence of uh, the replication of the European genealogy that I was talking about. I want to switch to a slightly different issue, again talking about Europe. You see, in Europe, what is very interesting is that I've given you the genealogy of secularism, but I want to give you quickly the genealogy of another concept which is quite different from secularism, but, but needs to be characterized because it's important in the history of understanding, it's important in understanding the history of these, this region of concepts is the notion of multiculturalism. Now, multiculturalism is a self-conscious version of what Nehru, in the discovery of India, called an unself-conscious pluralism. So multiculturalism is a self-consciously formulated version of that idea, and it emerged for very specific reasons in Europe, which was that after the Second World War, in which European nations had lost a lot of manpower, they were reconstructing their economies and they invited into their economies uh, a migration from the erstwhile colonies. And many of the migrants uh, came and worked on, they, they were invited to help reconstruct the economies due to, man, to labor shortages. And when they arrived, uh, they, they found themselves facing real trials, 
of racial hostility. The Maghrebi Muslims in the banlieue of Paris and other cities in France, uh, Indian and Pakistanis in all over Britain, Turks in Germany and so on. So they faced serious racial hostility and they felt that the secularism, which whose origins I expounded a little earlier, was too blunt an instrument to speak to their trials and difficulties in the context of being minorities facing these racial hostilities there. Because secularism, because of the, on the grounds that I, I mentioned, ushered all of it, treated everybody on a par, ushered out all of religion. Whereas they felt, but that doesn't speak to the minority specific difficulties and trials. So a new doctrine was formulated in which minoritarian aspirations for a comfort zone against racial hostility that they faced, which was quite severe and continues to be severe. And multiculturalism is the, broadly speaking, the idea, I'm speaking crudely here, but it's not doing any violence to uh, the issues. Multiculturalism is roughly the idea, as it was formulated, that there are no majorities. Everybody's a minority. That there just should not be a majoritarian uh, outlook. That everybody should be treated as a minority. Everybody is, uh, is equal. That's, that's, the, that's the aspiration of this new doctrine. It's very different from secularism. Very focused on minorities as an issue, which arose for very specific genealogical reasons after the Second World War in Europe. All right, so now, if you look at the current situation in India, there is a tendency amongst some commentators, by the way, I should add, that it is thrilling to me that quite apart from the remarkable things that are happening on the Maidan and the street, thanks mostly to the young, um, one of the things, everybody's noticed the effects that they have. We, our morale has been boosted by, by uh, the events of the last month. And, but one of the really tremendous outcomes of it is that even the mainstream press is publishing punditry of a very high quality. <laughs> I mean, even something like the Times of India, which, it, which it's... Uh, <laughs> No, which, which it is even odd to call it a newspaper. I mean, what it, really, <laughs> what it really does is bring together consumers and corporations right, on its pages. And it happens to have a few words on the page. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but even the Times of India, I think yesterday or the day before, had an editorial which cited, invoked the, the ex-civil servants claim that you know, this remarkable group of ex-civil servants from, headed by Aruna Roy and Sundar Bura and others um, to say that urging the Supreme Court to declare the CA, you know, this is the Times of India. I think this is a result really of what's happening on the street at Maidan and you know, I want to speak to that uh, a little more later on. Uh, so, there, but there is a tendency in some of the commentary to, to say, uh, some, it's mostly in the hands of professors, not in the hands of activists, to, to say that multiculturalism is the more appropriate uh, ideal right now because the minorities are being oppressed. And uh, I think I mean, I hate to say this, but I think that's hopeless. I think it's hopeless. I mean, the idea that in the present climate, with the complete domination in the mentality of, of ordinary people, of the idea of a Hindu nation, I mean, just everywhere. Every time I sit at an auto rickshaw or a taxi, I ask somebody, it's ha, tarakki ho rahe, ram mandir ban Everyone. It's just 
basically, you, it, it's so widespread that the idea that you're going to convince everybody that there is no majority, everybody's a minority, including the Hindus, is, is just pie in the sky. It is no way to put your best foot forward now. It's too remote an idea. What the young are doing on the streets in the Maidan is much more sensible. They're saying we already have a constitution, we already have the formal apparatus of, of secularism, which is there in the constitution because of what I said were the formal maneuvers after independence. Just fight for that because that is being undermined by these developments of, of registry and the CA, this pincer uh, combination of the CA and uh, the NRC, which everybody's written excellent commentary on. So I think, unlike the professors, the activists have it much more sensibly right. They're much more understanding of what is feasible one step at a time. Now, uh, I do want to raise some questions, however, uh, while talking about the, the present, uh, the current situation, that there's a lot of the, everything I read right now, so, so there's very useful, valuable data that has been presented, I think mostly by the CSDS <coughs> um, uh, scholars who are accumulating a, a valuable data bank. It looks as if we are right now in a very schizophrenic political scenario. At the formal electoral political level, the real resistance is happening in the regions, in the states. At the formal political electoral level, Maharashtra, people resisting in Bengal, Kerala, uh, Jharkhand, electoral outcomes. These are resistances, but they're happening at the state level. At the national level of formal electoral politics, there's no echo of this. The BJP just simply has a kind of stranglehold of the national level issues and national politics. This is evident from the data that you can gather from, especially the very useful provided by people like the CSDS and Christophe Schaffrelo and others. Now, the national level issues, however, though they're not being, they're not actually being fought at the parliamentary formal electoral level, because the BJP has a strong control over that at the national level, the real large issues are happening on the street and the Maidan. So the schizophrenia is that we have nothing to echo the resistance of the formal political uh, resistance at the national level, but we have the street and the Maidan, which is raising all the big issues. Citizenship, uh, authoritarianism, etc., resisting it. This is a, a, a really unusual situation. And one of the things one has to now think about, if one is thinking about the possibilities of secularism, is how do we integrate? What are the possibilities of integrating this? Now, there's some things, I don't have answers to this. Many of you probably have thought much harder about it because you've thought about it much, uh, much more from on the field than I do because I'm domiciled uh, away from here and only come here in the winters. Um, but one of the things I don't understand, and I raise these only as questions now before I end, I just want to raise some questions that I find very puzzling. One of the things that really I don't understand, but which could perhaps um, generate something on the large national issues at the formal political level, rather than just uh, 
the activists uh, in the squares and the streets. One of the things I don't understand, and this is not my view, by the way, because my eventual hopes are for a socialist India. So I'm now speaking from the point of view of, uh, I'm sort of holding my nose and raising questions that should be raised because of not my normative ideals, but about the descriptive uh, scene. What are, what are the corporations doing when a regime favors, so manifestly favors, a very small portion of the corporate sector, right? Called the Gujarati Mafia, as, as uh, <laughs> clearly, it is, there's no doubt that this regime favors a very small and brazenly, you know, it's got standard clichétic descriptions, crony capitalism and so on and so forth, right? 80% of the corporate sector is excluded from this particular way of promoting the corporate. What are they doing? See, I was brought up to think by my intellectual upbringing that in a capitalist society, what 80% of the corporate sector's interests are happens. But 80% of the corporate sector actually should be very unhappy and no doubt are unhappy, but they're completely pusillanimous. Right? I mean, Rahul Bajaj has made some noises, admirable, but what is, what are the Narayan Murthy's and the Aziz, what are they doing? Why aren't they forming alliances? Why aren't they, why aren't they doing something to keep a bourgeois party like the Congress party alive? It's dead in the water. Well, the Congress Party's learning curve is flat. Money, forgive me. For, <laughs> but what, why is it? Uh, why, why isn't the why isn't the bourgeoisie propping up a, a party which has always stood for them? And uh, because surely they don't want to put all their eggs. The bourgeoisie doesn't want to put all its eggs in one basket, a basket in which it's being marginalized in favor of the Gujarati capitalists. So, I mean, there's something completely shrouded in obscurity for me over here. Now, you can say that they are fearful and this government is, you know, is um, ruthless in the way, but I, I still stand by what I said. In a capitalist society, if 80% of the corporate sector want something, they should not be afraid. What they want can happen if it's a genuinely capitalist society. So you can't just say, oh, it's fascism, and it's not a capitalist society. It's, something here is not credible, and I don't get it. And we really have to try and understand what's going on. Maybe there are people here who can illuminate things for me. Uh, the, you know, one of the answers you immediately get is that, that uh, they, they can be pulled up for corruption and so on. But so here's another question I have for, for us. You see, when it comes to corruption in a society like ours, everybody in this room knows that every political party is corrupt. Nobody really seriously denies that. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think this, the the CPM is is somewhat of an exception, and is uh, and but every major political party which has any clout whatsoever, right? We know it to be deeply corrupt. So th th there was a very brilliant uh, fascist uh, political theorist called Carl Schmidt, who said. Sovereignty in liberal democracies lies in who gets to call the exception. What he meant by that is you can have all these lofty constitutions and laws protecting everything, but emergencies can be declared, exceptions can be declared, and whoever has the power to call the emergency is the sovereign. 
Okay, so I want to ask a corresponding question. Who gets to call corruption? You see, the UPA too fell because somebody called corruption. I mean, it fell for lots of reasons, but it fell because somebody called the corruption. Who was behind calling it the corruption? And who is not calling the corruption today? These are things we need to explore. Whoever gets to call the corruption has a middle level of sovereignty in this country. Who is it? We don't really know and haven't studied carefully enough where and how corruption gets called, who is the underlying caller of corruption. And I think that's something really worth trying to understand. So in the schizophrenic scenario that I've uh, briefly mentioned, there is, a, there is one way to think about it is that we should just acknowledge <clears throat> that there is no party at the national level, there's no scope for alliances at the national level, the real resistance is at the state level. It's a very depressing thought. The idea that politicians, third-rate politicians like Udav Thakare and Mamta Banerjee are going to save democracy is a very serious reflection of the country we are in. But it is true, they are being, they are a source of resistance of a very specific sort. Now, the question is, we know that that resistance is completely precarious, right? Nana Fadalva said the other day, yes, 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 things are fine. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen in Maharashtra. Tomorrow it might change. He knows perfectly well that these politicians can be bought, they can defect, nothing is stable. So this resistance can't be seen as some real, I mean the scope for it is completely precarious, right? just given the nature of the resistance it takes. So the question arises, how, when, it's so, when even the corporate sector is, is not promoting a national level uh, formal resistance, it's all only happening on the streets. One of the interesting questions to ask is, what are the national level issues that are being raised on the street? And of course, it's citizenship and it's formal basis, which are being fought for courageously uh, right now. But also, it's because in, in uh, when it is formulated and when, when there's resistance, there's tremendous authoritarianism. And, and so the anti-authoritarianism is absolutely central to the national level issues that are being fought. Now, what do I mean by the extraordinary nature of this authoritarianism? It's unprecedented in, in the post-colonial period, in the period of independence. What is what, what makes it exceptional? What makes it different from the emergency? What makes it different from the state authoritarianism against the peasantry and its rebellions all through the 60s and early 70s? This is just completely different. What is the difference? And how is it so extreme that whether you call it fascist or not, what makes it special? And the answer is, I believe, that, you see, Gramsci had, Gramsci had a notion of hegemony. It's a technical term. It's not hegemony. Hegemony doesn't mean just dominating people, controlling people, etc. For Gramsci, it's maybe, that's maybe what it is in ordinary parlance, but in Gramsci, it's a technical term. And the idea of hegemony is that there, whoever rules, and since, Gandhi, uh, since Gramsci was a Marxist, he was talking about classes. He said the ruling class has, in liberal democracies, is, gets to be the ruling class because it convinces all other classes that its interests are the interests of all other classes. Okay? That's what hegemony is for Gramsci. Yeah, I'll repeat that. 
whoever rules, in his interest it was ruling class, gets to be the ruling class by convincing everybody, every other class, that its interests are the interests of every other class. Right? Now, that's in liberal democracy. Now, when you have liberal democracy in that form, with he hegemony, as I've just expounded it, there's no need to be authoritarian. Right? You have convinced all other classes that your interests are their interests. Right? So you don't need to be authoritarian. Right? Only somebody who doesn't have Gramscian hegemony needs to be authoritarian. That's what happened, actually, in, in, in Indira Gandhi's emergency. Right? The Karibi Hatar program had manifestly not Hatar to Karibi, and she, had, uh, she did not have uh, hegemony, and it was driven, the, the authoritarianism was, was driven by uh, a feeling that hegemony was missing. This government boasts and congratulates itself on having hegemony, on having convinced everybody, yet continues to be authoritarian. Right? And if hegemony means you don't need to be authoritarian if you have a hegemony, and you're still authoritarian, that's compulsive. That's pathological. And the students have seen that. I mean, they've seen it in the sense that they've experienced it. Right? You've experienced it and you, you, you just, you're, you've got hegemony, you've got the national level, you've got the population, by and large, in the mentality of, of the European idea of nationalism. You don't need the hegemony. You are hegemonic. Don't call it fascism. It's, if you don't want to, it's pathological. It's absolutely compulsive. And the students have seen that. That is an inseparable issue. It's, you can't separate it from the issue of citizenship and so on. Those are the national level issues. And the question is, how can these issues of citizenship and anti-authoritarianism, which is so central, how is it possible for it to grow? And you have to admit that tremendous though the resistance is, how fantastic boost of morale for all of us as a result of it, it's still restricted to the cities and to the urban intelligentsia. So can it have the aspirations of effects of a wider spread? And all the objective conditions for it are there because, quite apart from economic issues of farmers' distress and so on, the plain fact is that ordinary people in the countryside are the least possessive, possess, uh, have the least documentation when it comes to registry of citizenship. They, you know, they don't know, they have no documentation. If you ask somebody where they are from, they say, from there. They have absolutely no way. So it is a real objective in their interests to uh, oppose this uh, registry. And there's every reason to think that it should spread if the registry is carried out. And the question is, will it or not? Will they put up with a lot of suffering during demonetization? Will they put up with the suffering to come. These are all open questions. Thank you very much.